And I have, uh, so my name is Brian Shannon. I also have uh, Kevin Robinson and Alan O'Leary from the Vault product management team with me. So uh, for the next hour, we're going to take you through, uh, we're going to talk about the Vault Talk meetings, the, uh, uh, the agenda, what these are all about. We're going to talk about upcoming webcasts. Then we're going to turn it over and we're going to talk about Autodesk University 2015 and all things Vault that are going on there. Then we're going to do a deep dive with Vault 2016 copy design and wrap it up with an open Q&A. Along the way, if you notice in uh, your go-to webinar meet, uh, session, there is a, an area where you can ask questions. So as we go, ask questions and we'll let those buffer up. We'll, ask, we'll answer them in line. But if it has something to do with specifically copy design or, or AU 2015, we'll answer those there. Uh, I've got a couple of other moderators uh, and panelists on the line that are here to uh, answer your questions. So with that, Let's talk about why we're here. The goal of these Vault Talks is to build awareness, to uh, get the community involved, share tips and tricks, uh, any updates, anything that we have from the software standpoint, uh, we want to let you know about that through these. And these are uh, being recorded, so you can go and watch these later on. Um, and this is really just a means of connecting with you and having you ask your questions and uh, sharing uh, what's going on. With, uh, with Autodesk Vault in the, in the Vault world. But we want to keep the party going. So after this and beyond this, there's a number of places where you can get engaged. We have the Vault Discussion Forum. So if you're an avid Vault user, you know about this right now. It's a support forum. It's out there. It's a, it's a, it's a free forum. Uh, you don't even have to be a customer, but you can go out there and peruse. Uh, chances are a question you have might have been already asked. We have a LinkedIn group called Vault Users and Experts. And don't worry, you don't have to be a five-star expert. You can actually just go out there and join the group, uh, join the discussion. You see a little call to action right now, uh, right there. So um, go out there after this. Um, uh, check us out on Facebook. So we communicate through Facebook. Um, follow us um, up on Twitter. And, it's, and then we have a blog that covers all things Autodesk Vault. And we share a little bit of the airtime with PLM 360. It's in the same family, same umbrella, same idea. Um, different products. So there's plenty of ways to keep connected. There's plenty of ways, whether you're a user, power user, or an administrator of Autodesk Vault, there's plenty of ways to uh, uh, stay connected. So let's talk about some fun facts. We have 105 signups for this. That's a pretty good community for a, for a webinar and a webcast. Doing a little bit of the math, looking at how do they find out. Um, a lot of people, most everybody, from email. A little bit from LinkedIn. So again, go out and sign up for that. And then other, I don't know, word of mouth, uh, maybe you saw a poster somewhere, I don't know, maybe there's a plane flying with a banner. But um, the good news is that's a lot of signups. Now, when asked what flavor of vault are, is being used, we have um, uh, most people are using one of the paid versions, Vault Pro or Vault Workgroup. Um, some of the uh, people are using Vault Basic, and that's good. And then uh, not yet, which means you're still looking at it, maybe you're considering it, uh, 8%. So, not bad. We have a good cross-section. And what we're going to talk about coming up here is uh, Autodesk University, a place that you can go and you can come and take a class, take a number of classes, find out more, um, and advance your knowledge and your career with Vault. So with that, I'm actually going to hand it over to Mr. Kevin Robinson, and he's going to take you through the Autodesk Vault uh, at AU 2015 in and out. So Kevin, you're the presenter. All right, just one second. Um, you switched me all the way to presenter, so let me fire up my slide deck. Oh, um, you have no worries. I uh, will be there in just a second. All right. So let me give this a whirl, and then let me know when you can see my slides, Brian. Good to go on my end. All right. Well, happy, uh, happy Thursday, everyone. Glad to have you guys all back on uh, Vault Talk with us. Um, took a little bit of a break from the airwaves, but um, we're, we're back to it. Um, so Autodesk University is um, just a tad under 60 days and 53 to be exact um, of when we're going to be hanging out in Las Vegas, hopefully with a lot of you. Um, and the venue this year is going to be the Venetian again, which is... Uh, you know, from Vegas standards, uh, pretty pretty awesome. Um, definitely um, better than the old days at MGM, and you had to walk three miles each way, uh, uphill both ways, I think, to get to the classes from the hotel. Um, but the Autodesk University is a really, really exciting event. Um, 
if you've never been, it's, it's just one of these things that uh, once you go, um, it's really tough to uh, miss a year. Um, I know, I don't know about Brian. Brian, how many AUs do you think you've been to nowadays? Oh, uh, it uh, goes back to the year 2000. So All right. 15, six, 16th, this coming one. Oh, so consecutive all the way? Yeah, yeah. All right, well, I, I have some gaps in mind. My, uh, my first AU was uh, 1998 in Philadelphia, but uh, there's definitely a few years I missed along the way, but I think I'm on uh, year 13 for myself. But hopefully many of you can either uh, continue your streak this year or start your streak this year. Um, to talk about what we did last year at AU, um, this is just a little bit of a flashback. So we had a lot of great classes last year um, and uh, a lot of fantastic topics to kind of get you an idea of all of the gamut of coverage that we have around Vault. And uh, more importantly, and the reason I want to share this today is um, when you AU, um, and also um, from a content creation standpoint, um, you know, our instructors um, put a lot of hours and a lot of effort into making the best possible content. And um, some of those classes that you can see here in bold were actually recorded in entirety. So. The actual, the, the, the live screen performance, any demos that were done, the audio, all of those things for all the classes that are in bold here can be found at au.autodesk.com and there'll be a big click the learn online button that you'll see there and you'll be able to go through that catalog and check a few of these out. Otherwise, all the classes that are uh, not bolded, um, if the instructor uploaded any PDFs or PowerPoints for that class, that uh, can be made available too. So, you know, AU, while the highlight, um, at least for us in the U.S., um, in the largest uh, Autodesk University event is in Las Vegas face-to-face, -face, um, the learning can happen year long. Year long. So if you go to au.autodesk.com, there's tons of assets up there now from past years um, to kind of get you going. So be sure and check that out. Uh, a little bit from the stats specifically, so we had 19 of the almost 170 classes from manufacturing last year. Um, some of these other stats are really exciting, you know, guys like myself and Brian and all of the instructors that put a ton of effort into making um, great content and a great learning experience. Um, we like to make sure that our attendance numbers are, you know, higher than average, our speaker ratings and class satisfactions are higher than average, and you can see here, um, we accomplished that last year, and we hope to make those stats even stronger this year with our offering. So specifically this year, um, just a tad under 30 total vault classes. And then specifically for manufacturing content, uh, part of the data management and PLM track, we have 21 classes. Um, so the gap there may be some classes like um, programming or API for vault. Um, which is a little bit more horizontal. Um, some of the classes are more of a business management track around helping justify the vault um, or other investments like that. Um, or potentially we have a, a great customer success story class that um, uh, Damien uh, is going to do um, from Evans Consoles that talks about how they implemented and use uh, the product design suite and Vault Professional in their organization. So it's cross product. Uh, so that's kind of the delta difference there. Very specifically, um, when we talk about the manufacturing uh, Vault PLM classes for this year, um, we, we went a little bit further this year and we wanted to make sure we had different tracks based on likely where you or your colleagues are at around Vault. So we have the kind of the tire kickers. Your, you know, some of the folks that are on the call today that aren't yet in paid vault um, or haven't uh, implemented vault at all yet, uh, or you're really new to it and you, you really want to get um, some more coverage on uh, either how other customers are using it. So um, the, the scheduling of the classes and the topics um, really have been set up to where if in fact you're more of a, a newer user or a tire kicker, as we say, um, you can go throughout the week and get a sampling of classes that make the most sense for you. Um, those that have been on Vault for a while, paid or free Vault, um, and you, you just really want to start amping it up and taking it to the next level, you can see there's a lot of great classes to choose from, from that. Um, 
you know, for many of you that have maybe used Vault just in the confines of engineering for years, um, I would suggest check, checking out the Vault Office class. Um, there's about four down here. It's called Beyond Engineering to Sales, Purchasing, and Management. Uh, another really exciting technology is Vault Data Standard. It's been uh, in the portfolio for about 18 to 24 months now. Um, it really can uh, help enforce things that you uh, you do from a naming convention standpoint and make sure that uh, your users, instead of following along in like a CAD standards binder, um, they can just design and Vault will manage and enforce a lot of those things for them. Um, maybe uh, your IT administrator has uh, left the company and left you in charge of the Vault um, and you want to amp up your Vault administration skills. Uh, Jason and Irvin are going to be doing a class together on becoming a master Vault administrator. Um, so that'll be a great class. Um, as we all know, you know, there's a lot of technology and changes happening um, with cloud nowadays. And uh, Vault is a, a piece of technology that you can put into a, a hosted environment. And uh, Matt Bussey is going to be, uh, again, working with Irvin and talking about um, some of the considerations and choices you might make choosing between platforms like Amazon Web Services or micro Microsoft Azure um, for where you may want to host your Vault, if that's something your company is interested in. Um, and then as we move down a little bit further, you know, kind of more of a broad approach, but um, you know, if you have an ERP system and today yourself or your engineers are handing data over to purchasing and you're manually keying in data um, and you'd like to maybe fast track that and move to something like items, there's great classes and an integration options class here um, where you can learn a little bit more about different approaches to taking data from Vault and pushing that into your ERP system. Um, and a very, very popular class every year is the Data Management Avengers class. Um, this is where uh, smart guys like Alan, Irvin, um, Adam Lutenbacher, Michael Martin, guys that have been around the vault campfire for a long time now, um, they're in front of the room and uh, it's typically standing room only and people just fire questions left and right and uh, try to get the Avengers to stump on a few things. So that's a really good class. and. Um, typically pretty entertaining to see some of the guys have to do a little bit of tap dancing if they weren't inspect inspecting uh, out of the out of right field question. Another one to highlight is um, the crystal ball class. Um, this one does require your signature on a form. Um, this is where you come and uh, you do a non-disclosure um, form where we talk about some potential, some futures of the vault and uh, Basically, whatever you hear in that class is uh, something you can't go and tell other people about. Um, so if you plan on attending that class and you sign up for it, make sure you get there a little bit earlier to kind of beat the line on getting your paperwork filled in for that class. Um, so that's a real high-level short version. Um, but um, you know, take a look at these different tracks. Um, when you go up to uh, au.autodesk.com, whether maybe you've already registered, um, and you're looking to fill some additional classes in, the quick way to find the Vault classes is uh, just go to the catalog and pick Vault products. And if you want to pare that down a little bit further, um, you can go into the subtopics or the cross industry and pick a few other ones. Um, another cool thing is on the right hand side, kind of give you an idea of seats remaining. Um, so for example here, the introduction to Vault data standards is pretty slim. Um, so it's just down to 12 seats. Um, the catalog and the uh, operations people do a pretty good job, though, if these classes um, do fill up, depending on logistics, sometimes they'll bump into a bigger room. Um, but definitely take a look at that if you haven't filled in your schedule um, or if you haven't signed up for uh, AU yet, hopefully the vault classes will be the first on your list. So again, 53 days to go, tons of great options. Um, for uh, how you may break up your week between Vault and other products. But just in case you wanted to learn all things Vault, um, we have a Vault class for every single time slot, for every single day covering manufacturing. So um, you really could make it a Vaulted AU if you wanted to, only do Vault this year. Um, so we got a, about another 10 days um, where you can save your boss a little bit of money 
on uh, AU. So it's about $300 price increase that will go into effect on the 18th there. Um, so just a tad under two grand. Um, throw in a couple nights at the hotel. Um, if you have, uh, it's always great to be able to stay right at the hotel where we host it. Um, but uh, in case uh, your boss is a little cash, con uh, cash conscious on where you spend your hotel, there's uh, some options nearby as an alternative because uh, it is Vegas. So hopefully you guys can uh, make it out to Vegas this year. If you want to follow along on uh, Twitter to learn all the cool things that are going on at AU, uh, just follow along on this hashtag. Um, for AU 2015. All right, so with that, um, that was my uh, little preamble about AU. We'll turn it over uh, to Mr. O'Leary to talk about copy design. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, so uh, hopefully everyone um, is able to see that. So uh, I, I introduced before, but um, just a quick summary. Um, uh, I'm Alan O'Leary, one of the product managers on Vault. Uh, based out of the San Francisco office, I've been here at Autodesk for about uh, seven or eight years. Uh, and copy design is one of my, um, uh, I suppose, uh, responsibilities uh, in terms of, uh, of product functionality. Um, a few things as we jump into the new copy design worth understanding. Um, the new copy design adds a standalone component as well as the ability to copy design directly from Vault Explorer. Um, so if you do a little searching around uh, under your programs, you'll find a, a, an ex a separate executable for, uh, for copy design. And this will allow you to, uh, to run a bit of endless dialogue and work outside of the, the Vault Explorer with your copy design. So uh, have it on two different screens and be working in, uh, in between the two, uh, uh, the two applications. Um, this is completely different to the way we've traditionally solved the copy design issue. Um, so obviously many of you will be familiar uh, with uh, copy design as it was in the, uh, the first release of Vault. Uh, it's a very compelling tool. It's one of the main reasons people um, uh, implement Vault from a, an end user perspective to get their hands on copy design. Uh, and we've really um, uh, taken a different approach to uh, and a more advanced approach to how we do uh, copy design based on user feedback over the years. Um, some of the niceties we've added in here, configurable uh, interface, we've enhanced the productivity by uh, making it a server side um, a processing operation now. Um, and uh, as I've sort of said, most of what we've uh, pushed into the new uh, version of copy design is, uh, is user-led um, in terms of the way they are copying the size of the, the data that's being copied. Uh, and we've added a number of other, um, we've added a number of other uh, specific wishes around numbering, uh, property editing, and things like that. So uh, again, um, as I mentioned there, this is a, uh, can be a separate um, uh, standalone install. You'll see that uh, copy design now is a, an option underneath your uh, install configuration. Um, really important to note here though, for those of you who are using Vault Basic, uh, don't rush out uh, and try to use the, uh, the new copy design as you see it here today, because unfortunately, um, the new copy design is only available in uh, Vault Professional and uh, Vault Workgroup. So uh, the old version is still um, uh, the default and current tool in, uh, in Vault Basic. Right. A few little things for, for administrators and uh, folks that like to, to geek out on the, the call today. Um, uh, the copy design settings, um, as of the 2016 release, are all installed on the local user machine, which means we need to run and configure copy design on the end user machine to uh, to set our preferences. Now, if we want um, the same preferences across our entire environment, we would need to uh, to deploy these files. So you'll see there they're stored underneath the app data location, and using some basic file. Uh, distribution tool, deployment manager, uh, we can actually roll those out to every, all the users' machines so everyone has a, at least uh, the same starting point for their copy design operations. 
Okay. But um, let's jump in um, with that preamble out of the road and have a look at, um, at the actual interface and some of the workflows that we can achieve with copy design. So I'm going to try and um, set aside some, some time here for live demo. So I'm going to uh, quickly go through some of the, the high level functionality here. Um, you would have seen at the start of the presentation a link to the Under the Hood blog. Um, and, and that's certainly worth uh, checking out uh, if you guys want to jump into some more detail. Um, you'll see looking up at the site here, I just did a quick search. Uh, and this is the recent series of uh, copy design articles that I've, uh, I've posted there. And these get really into depth into copying eye parts and eye assemblies, uh, how we're going to uh, run the copy design, um, actually deploying files, which we just talked about, uh, action rules, uh, replacing files, uh, showing references. Um, uh, excluding files. So there, there's a lot of in-depth content on all the stages of copy design here. Uh, and we've also, of course, got the help menu, which gives you the step-by-steps and uh, a little bit more of the, the background. So uh, please go to Under the Hood to, to get more deeper into a lot of the, the specific workflows. But let's jump in. So our, our user interface now is split uh, essentially into um, uh, three main sections, which is our ribbon uh, menus and commands across the top. Uh, we have a main grid uh, which shows us the current selection set uh, and the configuration options. Uh, and then we have a series of panels which allow us to uh, dive a little bit deeper uh, into the uh, operations that are being carried out uh, and gives us some additional functionality. So starting with the ribbon, um, you see here we can, um, from the ribbon, uh, jump into the vault menu. This gives us some of our um, uh, configuration uh, options, so whether or not we're showing drawings, uh, whether we sh are selecting references or instances of files, uh, automatically copying parents, linking drawings and models, uh, a lot of the uh, behind the scenes operations that will, that will influence workflows. Um, up here we can, uh, we've got our, you'll see we've got our add object um, uh, command there which allows us to add files once we've got the copy design window open. Um, options to include children um, uh, uh, as part of the operation and references. Uh, we've got our uh, copy settings, which is copy all or copy uh, parent, the, the top level selections. Uh, here we can actually also uh, set the rule sets, and we'll talk a little bit about rule sets towards the end. And then we've got our run copy. probably want to play with uh, on every copy operation. They live on that ribbon at the top level. Uh, and some of these more uh, advanced settings that you might want to set and forget, they live under this vault menu uh, on the far left here. So uh, we'll dive in and have a look a little bit of how that relates to, to usage. So uh, a couple of important things uh, about the, the next one, the main grid. Um, this is probably the primary place to interact with the, um, uh, the selection set. Um, you'll see we're able to actually configure what appears uh, in the main grid. So uh, by default, we're going to show you um, the files that are selected by their name. We'll show you um, maybe part number, uh, the current action that's being performed on that file, uh, and a couple of important bits of information like uh, the ID, uh, the count, uh, and also our results. So. Um, the ID uh, allows us to actually identify uh, each individual uh, reference to a file because there may be more than one reference to a file inside of a copy. And the count tells us how many files, uh, how many instances of that file or references to that file uh, there are going to be uh, as a result of the copy operation. Okay, so worthwhile having those two there. They're going to uh, just help us understand a little bit more about what the copy design result is going to be. Um, this grid, um, although we can configure display and we can change the actions in here, is essentially read-only. We can't actually go and directly edit things like file name, uh, we can't uh, change uh, properties in this grid, all that is done through panels. So uh, it's configurable, but at this stage it is a, a read-only grid. Uh, finally, once we finish the copy design, this will show the results. 
So this uh, same interface will, gives us, will give us ticks or crosses if there are any issues during the final copy operation. Uh, and that gives us the chance to fix anything if there's, uh, if there's issues. The next one, uh, next section to look at here is the panels. So the panels, um, we have four of them. We have a where used, uh, an actions, a numbering, and a folder panel. So uh, these all have very specific tasks to help us uh, uh, figure out what's going on. Uh, you'll see the, um, if we start with the where used panel, this is actually going to show us uh, the, what the current selected file is referenced to. Um, so when I click on a, a file that isn't copied, it's going to show me the targets uh, or where it's going to exist after the copy operation. Uh, if I select to copy it, it's going to show me what the original file was. It's also going to show me what the new file is going to be and where the new file is going to be used. Um, so this is a, a nice quick check to make sure that we're not doing anything uh, silly with our configuration. We're not going to be uh, creating a new file in the wrong place. Uh, the numbering panel, this is actually going to allow us uh, a view of uh, what our new file number is going to be. So one of the big enhancements we made to uh, copy design uh, in the new version is the ability to or apply automatic numbering. Um, we can also use the old uh, renaming capabilities inside of um, uh, copy design, which is uh, essentially uh, adding a prefix or a suffix to the existing name. So you'll see here we can uh, we can go into the numbering uh, panel. We can change the numbering scheme for the specific files. Uh, we can edit uh, file names, and we can compare what the old and the new file names are. So that's very handy to see uh, uh, what uh, what the results of the copy is going to be from new file name perspective. Uh, another very important one is the action tab. So the action tab here gives us the, the ability to uh, start to split or filter through. Uh, what actions we've currently got in the, in the main grid. So in the main grid, we can actually see which files are being copied, we can see which files are going to be reused, which ones are going to be replaced, but uh, we can certainly get into a situation where we've got a lot of files sitting in the main grid, and it's not always obvious um, what, the, uh, what the actions are on each file. So in here, we can come and do a quick check, uh, get a list of the files that we're copying, get a list of the files which are being reused, um, Perhaps most importantly, we can come in here and see uh, a list of files that are being edited. Now, normally we don't want to edit files, so it's very useful if we can come in here and and see any potential issues we might be uh, creating by uh, by doing an edit on a file. Uh, and finally, we've got the uh, folder uh, panel. Now, this one uh, is, uh, I suppose, providing a tree view of uh, where our files are going to be uh, copied from and copied to. Um, so the tree view is load, it loads only um, the folders and references that are currently in the selection set, but it shows us where, um, where they're living now and where they're going to be copied to. Uh, it also gives us some fairly advanced functionality to move uh, or to copy files based on uh, their location. So we can actually come in here and select a folder and copy the complete contents of that folder to a new folder. Um, one of the things we're looking at for the future is also the ability to have a list view here, so you can copy in a similar way to the way you used to, which was the find replace, uh, and actually look for a string of text. Um, we believe in most cases it's actually faster to uh, use the tree view and uh, copy to new locations, but you know people are comfortable doing it the old way, so we're looking at uh, at implementing a way that you can. Uh, uh, we can use the legacy approach to rename uh, the, the target paths for, for copy. So all of these panels can be turned on and off. Uh, we can uh, dock and, and undock these so you can move them onto different screens. You can show more than one at a time and move in between them. Uh, so this is really designed to be a totally separate interface, uh, uh, you know, in terms of the, uh, the way we lay out uh, copy design and, and work with the information. Alright, um, I think we'll fairly soon get in and have a look at a, a quick live demo so you guys can, can see how this all fits together. But essentially uh, we have uh, four primary or uh, several specific copy operations in the, the new uh, tool. So the first one is obviously copy. Uh, copy is going to take the selected file, um, copy it with a new name 
to the folder that it currently resides in. So that means the original file and the new file will both be in the same folder. Uh, copy branch is going to select a file and everything below that file uh, to copy it to a new location or to the same location. So this is just, uh, I want to copy an assembly and all the files inside of that assembly, then I would use copy branch. Uh, a little bit different is copy two. Copy two allows us to copy uh, the selected uh, object, uh, but it allows us to pick a new target location for that. So we can actually go and type in or select a new uh, folder location where this file is going to be copied to. So uh, that's uh, a way to build a folder uh, or select a folder and copy at the same time. Now an interesting one here is, uh, is exclude. So, uh, and this gets into some more uh, complex workflows. But a good example here would be, I want to copy an assembly, for example, but I don't want any drawings of that assembly. What I would do is I would select my drawing view, I would exclude uh, a drawing, and I would copy the assembly. The result would be I would only have a new assembly with no drawing files if that's the approach you want to take. Uh, what exclude does not do is it does not remove files from the tree of a, uh, an adventure assembly, for example. Um, the idea here is um, we cannot do anything in copy design that will break the references. So anything that we copy, we need to be able to open that up in Inventor or in AutoCAD afterwards. So uh, an important point there. Exclude uh, allows you to leave a file out of the operation. Uh, but typically it's a, it's a file at that top level. Uh, again, a, an example might be you want to copy three sub-assemblies from a top level assembly, but you don't want a new top level assembly. We can use exclude to, to cut that out. Okay. Um, some of the other uh, options we have here is uh, remove. Uh, remove will take away the attachments from a file, so if we've got PDFs connected to a file or something else, some other Word documents attached, uh, we can remove those so they're not included in the, the new assembly or the new uh, the copy of the file. Uh, we have the ability to replace, uh, fairly obvious, that allows us to swap uh, an existing file in the uh, copy uh, structure uh, with an existing file. Uh, we have reuse, this is as you might imagine, uh, means we're going to keep the same file as the original in the, uh, uh, in the, the target location. So uh, the file is not going to be copied or edited in any way. Uh, and reuse branch. This is a way that we can go in and select uh, an entire assembly and all its children and set it back to reuse. So it's a nice quick way to remove all the copy operations from a structure. So really, you know, uh, three primary ones we're probably going to look at there, which is copy, replace, and reuse. Uh, but there's lots of little other uh, options here to assist with uh, productivity and, and uh, help with some of the workflows. Right. Uh, some of the other things you're going to see uh, happening in the background when we start to apply actions, uh, we're going to see a new one which is called auto. Uh, and auto means that we're going to um, give a file the exact same name as its child uh, and we're going to give it uh, or save it to the same location as its child. So the auto is typically applied to drawing files um, which have the same name and the same location as, their, uh, as the assembly or the file that's referenced inside of them. And the other one is edit. Now if we um, decide that we want to reuse a drawing and we want to uh, copy the file um, inside of that uh, drawing or that dependency, what's going to happen is that the drawing is going to be edited and we're going to have a, a reference to a new file. So let's be careful about this because that's usually a mistake. It's not usually what people want. Uh, so we've put edit in red text uh, to remind you that this might not be something you want to do. So that's the basics of uh, essentially of, um, uh, of using the copy design. So I might um, jump across here and we'll, uh, we'll take a look at, uh, at doing a copy. So I'm inside my Vault Explorer. Um, uh, as we've done in the past, I can select uh, an assembly here, uh, right click and you see here's my copy design. So in Vault Professional and Vault Workgroup, this will load the new interface and you can see here, here's my ribbon strip across the top. 
Uh, my main pain with uh, all the relevant information for each of the files, including state revision, uh, here's the current action list, uh, and the ID and account. Uh, over on the right hand side, here's my uh, where used uh, panel, which shows me the catch post uh, is, uh, has only one reference, which is inside the padlock assembly, uh, which is inside a simplified model, um, which is inside the padlock assembly. So this is fun. You'll see here, this is actually our support for circular references. I can actually go on pretty much to infinity clicking on this reference. <laughs> You'll be pleased to know though it doesn't automatically expand. But this is our where used. So it's showing me on the selected file uh, where it's come from and where it's going to go to. Uh, the next one is my actions. You'll see at the moment everything is set to reuse. Here is my numbering schemes. There's, uh, at the moment I have four numbering schemes that I am uh, have available and I'll show you how to move those uh, between numbering schemes shortly. And here's my folder view. So this shows me the source uh, of all those uh, files. Okay. So let's go in and do some basic operations. So I'm going to select uh, to uh, copy this retainer. You'll see by default the parent uh, is going to be copied as well uh, and you can see it's automatically numbered. So the action tells me it's going to be copied, uh, highlights them and gives me a new name in the main grid. Uh, if I go to my folder view, you can see there it shows me that these are going to be saved to the same location as the original file. Okay. So I can move these to different locations just by dragging and dropping. Um, I can also, you'll see here, grab something like the uh, combo spring, uh, move that to a new folder that is automatically going to be copied. Okay, so we can do uh, a lot of kind of fun, uh, interesting stuff with the uh, uh, with this um, uh, folder view. Uh, and you'll see if I select uh, copy two here, uh, I can come up to this designs level, create a new folder, and say new components. All right, you see it's it's telling me it's going to create a new folder. There's my new components, and there's that file now being placed in that new folder. Okay. If I go to my numbering schemes, you'll see at the moment uh, I have uh, an ADSK numbering scheme. Uh, I can come in here and edit this and start to change some of the file names. You'll see them change over here. Uh, I have a list view which allows me to change some of the settings. Uh, I can also change the numbering schemes. So uh, at the moment, the ADSK is my default numbering scheme, but I can uh, uh, ch say change scheme here and move that to uh, sequential. Uh, I can grab another one here and say move that, that to the copy design thing. So down the bottom here, I can click on that. You'll see here's the new name for that file. Uh, and I've just got a basic sequential scheme here which is going to apply just a six number scheme to the file. So uh, in here I get uh, access to, to modify uh, and change my file names, apply different schemes. Let's quickly check the actions. So you'll see here's all the files which are set to copy, here's all the files which are set to reuse. So uh, I can do a quick check there and we'll have a look at uh, what our where use looks like now. You can see this shows me the destination. Uh, and this shows me now retainer is going to have a new, uh, is going to create a new file which is going to go into a new assembly and I can again track that structure to make sure I'm doing the right thing. All right. So that uh, is a very basic uh, copy. It's worth noting too, we could probably do most of this without having the panels, but the panels do give us that extra information. Um, I can copy more than one file at a time here. So you'll see I can go and uh, select add uh, underneath uh, designs. Let's grab this. Okay, so you can see now I've got two um, two different uh, file sets that I'm uh, I'm able to copy. All right, so more than one at a time, improving the functionality. Uh, if I'd like to, I can include attachments here. So this is going to go and load any uh, additional files. Uh, as I sort of said, PDFs, uh, Word documents which might be attached, uh, and I can also include library files. So by default, library files are reused, as it was in the old version. 
Uh, I can select copy top node so I can quickly go and copy all. And finally, I've got my uh, create coffee button. So um, let's go through and, uh, and have a quick look at, uh, at how this works. You'll see uh, this goes through. It actually creates the folders. It now checks out all the part numbers from the numbering schemes. Um, so it gets the sequential number. Uh, of course, it does a check to make sure that I have read-write access to all the folders. I have access to all the files that I'm trying to copy. Uh, like they're on the local site. So it does a whole bunch of pre-checks here. If there's any errors, it will tell me. Right. But there we go. I've now, it tells me I've successfully copied uh, all these files. And uh, it's done very quickly because those files aren't being downloaded. It's all being done on the server. Okay. So if we go and have a quick look at the results here. Um, I'll click on my, oh, let me close that down first. You'll see I've got a new components folder here which was created as part of the operation. Interestingly too, you'll notice I also have a drawing file here. So we're going to have a, little, a quick look at how the drawing file got copied, but this is now living in the same location as the PAR file. Um, here are the rest of my newly created files with their uh, various file names uh, and associated drawings and presentation files. Now I don't know if we want to stop and ask some questions there before we go on to the, the next um, uh, section. Um, Kevin, Brian, do you have any questions at the moment that are, seem to be burning? I do. Um, so uh, the first question is, um, is there any plan capabilities to allow users to set the values in action rules other than the four current options? Gotcha. Well, we're just about to get to, to that section. Um, uh, there are plans. Um, I'm not sure when and if that will be delivered, but we certainly, the intent was that we would be able to configure um, properties on the new files in the same operation. Okay, and then um, another question was, um, why are some properties unable to be changed by Vault? As an example, creation date is a big one. Mm -hmm. There are some, um, uh, as we are not uh, opening files, there are some limitations to what we can edit during the copy design operation. Okay. And we, uh, uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean it won't, we won't ever be able to solve that issue, but um, we need to, you know, uh, this copy design is very much work in progress. We've delivered, um, a whole bunch of enhancements in 2016. Uh, we have uh, plans to deliver more in uh, 2017, and we will continue to, to sort of evolve this tool as we gather more feedback. So uh, I think one of the main areas we want to look at is uh, the rule sets. And I think a number of you may be aware uh, the team has, or some users are having issues with migrated vaults with, uh, with the rule sets. So this is something that we need to address, yes. And last one before I release you back there, Alan, is um, um, can you confirm if these copy design enhancements uh, are part of Vault Basic? They are not. As, I, right. said, as I said at the start, we use a Vault Professional and Vault Workgroup only. Uh, there's, some, there's some technical reasons for that um, in terms of uh, obviously the the nature of the files and uh, state-based securities, uh, user-defined properties, there's a number of limitations there. All right. Well, um, I don't have too much more time, so I want to quickly go through some of the configuration settings uh, and hopefully we'll wrap this up in 10 minutes and allow you a little time at the end to close out. Um, uh, there, Kevin, I'm, I know I'm probably running a bit over time. Uh, the first one is drawing view. Uh, this gives us an alternate way to view the data so we can actually see and modify the drawings independent uh, of the model. Uh, and we'll have a quick look at uh, what that looks like in a second. Uh, we can now, in this new version, select references. Uh, and what that means is instead of copying every uh, reference to a specific object or to a specific file, I can re reuse one and copy a different one. You'll see in you know in this quick little mock-up here, you know we might be using that same gear 
in uh, nine places, uh, and I can actually do two or three different operations uh, across that whole group of, of objects. Not all of them need to be copied. Not all of them need to be reused. Um, by default, we're copying parents. This actually stops us from, um, from breaking uh, or editing files during the copy. Uh, but we'll have a look what it, lo what it looks like when we say that we don't want to copy parents. Um, linking drawings and models is on by default. That's default behavior. And we just saw an example of, of how that works, where the drawings are automatically copied when we copy the, um, uh, the model. Uh, we have action rules, which we, we had those few questions on. Uh, these allow us to configure and map some very specific properties. Uh, and probably most importantly, allows us to reset or, or set blank uh, properties that we don't want to have incorrect information in them. Right. We looked at the numbering schemes already. Uh, that's been included, so we don't need to rename files to make them compliant after we will copy. Uh, and with that, I might jump across and uh, show a quick a couple of quick examples of those uh, those configuration settings. Okay, so I'm going to go back um, into my padlock assembly, do a copy design. Okay, here's the same uh, view we saw previously, and you'll see this is uh, what we would refer to as a, a model view. If I now select my drawing view, you'll see. I have at the top level all the drawings and presentation files which are included uh, in the operation. Okay, So I select case outer and I copy. You'll see the drawing is set to default. Okay, It's, it's going to have the same name as the file. It's going to be saved to the same location as the file. And it gets this auto label on it to tell you that it's going to be the same. Okay. Uh, now, what if I uh, reuse branch here? I'm going to go back, and I'm going to select not to automatically copy parents. I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to copy. You'll see my drawing file is still set to auto, so it's still going to be copied, and it's going to have the same name and be saved to the same location. You'll see the assembly is now going to be edited. So that's scary. That means that I am going to modify an existing file instead of creating a new one. So you just need to be aware of that. Okay, and we've written in red text there that this is edited. Right. I'm going to select to reuse branch again. Right. Uh, this time I'm going to turn off the link drawings and model. Okay. Now you'll see selecting case out again. Right. I'm now editing the drawing. So again, that could be a concern because it's going to build a new reference. But this allows me to come in here now and I can say, I want to copy my drawing to a different location and I want to give it a different name. Okay. So now we can start to see um, some different behaviors between the model and the drawing. Um, as I sort of said, the default behavior is when we copy the model, the drawing is going to go with it uh, and have the same name and that's usually good enough for most people. But if you want to, we can uh, go completely the other way, switch off the link drawing and model, uh, and um, allow you to uh, copy and modify each of them independently. Uh, the last one I want to quickly show here is the um, select references. So you'll see here um, I have uh, a count on the combo spacer of three. This means there's three of them in the assembly. So if I copy that, they're going to have a new name. Uh, uh, which is this uh, ADS K Mech, and there's going to be three of them. They're all going to be exactly the same. Um, if I select to reuse, obviously it goes back to the original name, and I've still got three. If I turn on select references, though, I'm now able to um, select copy, and you'll see now I'm only going to get one of these. Okay. Um, the other versions are now only going to have two instances. So I can come through um, uh, and uh, actually change these independently. So um, if I go to my combo spacer down here, you can see there's now two of them which are being reused. I'm going to copy this. And now I've got another individual file which is going to have a different name saved to a different location, most likely, uh, with a count of one. So that's the difference there. 
Selecting references, I can act. Uh, I can put different actions on each of those files, uh, or each, each uh, reference to that file, instead of copying the file everywhere it's being used. Okay. Let's jump back um, and see. Have a look at um, uh, at some of the capabilities that we've we've already viewed most of this. So I don't think we need to go too in depth. But folder-based copy, uh, I can drag and drop between locations to um, uh, to define which files should be copied um, and which files should be uh, reused. Uh, I can build a new structure directly in Copy Design. Uh, we saw the circular reference support. Uh, I'm able to see the full tree, including uh, you know where the simplified models are being referenced. Uh, I can dig very deep into into those circular references in AutoCAD and in Inventor. Um, Reference-based copy, deciding for each reference how it should behave. Oh. Uh, we've got the replace pending files. So when I replace a file, I can actually uh, choose to consolidate, for example, and uh, insert uh, a reference to a file that's not yet created. That's kind of fun. Uh, that's worth testing out. Um, uh, and we might even have a, a chance to quickly view that before we finish up. Uh, so as we've, we've already seen the execution, uh, we run a, a bunch of pre-checks at the end. Um, we uh, refresh to, to reload the, the latest data if we need to. Um, at the moment, Melt Copy Design is only going to copy the latest. So uh, if you've got old files, out-of-date files, uh, we'll need to refresh those before we do the, the copy. Uh, and it's all done on the server. Okay, once it's done, we see our results and we can refresh just to go again. So I'm going to uh, jump back in and show the last couple of bits to the copy design. Um, we're going to have a quick look here at the replace. Um, so you'll see here I've got the, a replace command. Um, and I am able to either select from the existing folders um, to replace it with a, uh, a new part. Or I can select pending data. And these are the new files which are going to be created as a result of the operation. So I can come in here and I can select a file that doesn't exist yet, and I can replace it in the model. So when we've finished with the copy, it's going to replace it back into the model with the new file. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of cool. Uh, and the last one I wanted to look at was the action rules. So you'll see at the moment, I'm using a default rule set. Uh, but we do have uh, the ability to set the action rules underneath here. So if I've got a new uh, product rule creation, you can see here, uh, very similar to the way we apply rules uh, to categories, I can select a, a rule for part files and say anything that is a part file that has the file extension IPT, I want to reset the category name. And what that means is it's going to have the default revision scheme, the default life cycle scheme, uh, and it'd be the default category for a part file. It's just going to read the rules on what happens to new part files. Uh, I can remove iLogic. To what it should be. Um, if I want this to behave completely as a new file, I can hit reset all. That's just going to reset everything back to its default behaviors for a new file. Uh, or I can look to map some other things. So you'll see here, um, I can take something like uh, the part number and I can say I want to, um, oh, did I already have something set for the part number? I can set value as. And I can pick uh, a very finite list. This is the question that came in before. We don't have many we can choose from. But I can come in here and say I want to select the part number to be the same as the file name. And that's going to update my part number in the new file. So we're looking to expand this rule set. But this is uh, essentially what we've got now for the rule set. So this is going to, um, when we complete the copy operation, put it back to the default behavior for revision and life cycle. It's going to add a part number to it. It's going to have an empty description. Um, and it's going to hopefully have the, the date file created reset. OK. I OK that. And I can then apply the rule set to my window. You'll see there the tooltip tells me which rule set I'm going to use. And again, uh, I can execute that to finish the copy. But I think um, that's all we're going to have time for today. Um, as I said, please uh, jump onto Under the Hood and, and get uh, more in-depth on these topics. Uh, I've written a lot of information there. I've got the help menu and we've got the AU course from last year.
So uh, thanks for your time, and let, let's if we've got time for questions, Kevin, fire away. All right. So um, as always, you know, if you guys have any additional questions, I know we got a few here in the queue already. Um, let me um, try to sort through a few of these. Um, what I want to do is. Um, the, a couple of you have questions typed in. It might be easier just to have you ask the question live. So if any of you have a mic or dialed in and you can talk, use the raise your hand function. Um, and what I'll do is I'll open your line and then we'll go from there. All right. All right, Damien, you're up. Hey, Damien, you have a question? Do you hear me? All right. You oh. there, Damien? Yeah, yeah. Do you hear me now? Yeah, by the way. All right. Hi, Adam. A uh, question for you. Um, how is that new system actually going to work when you have like derived sketch that has been used on numerous parts? When we have a sketch that's been used in numerous parts, like a skeletal uh, model? Yeah. Um, so you're deriving, you derive that sketch into uh, several several parts and you are doing a copy design of those parts and you want to copy design as well that, that sketch. How is it going to work? Uh, that will work just fine. So you select the, the sketch um, uh, and you say you want to uh, copy. Uh, it, you know, if we've got uh, our parents automatically selected, everywhere that it's derived is going to be also copied. But the nice thing is because we now have reference mode, if you have some derived parts that you don't want to update, uh, we can uh, unselect those and just reuse the sketch in some instances. Okay. Yeah. Right. So uh, you can. Uh, we've got a lot more flexibility there than we used to. That, that should yeah. be that workflow should be improved. Perfect. Thanks. Nice. All right. So um, there is a really good question here. It says, uh, "Is there a way to distribute rule sets across multiple PCs?" Yeah, so we would have to um, basically um, using some some deployment software or a little script, uh, we'd copy those uh, files uh, across all the users' machines. Um, so the rule sets are actually saved underneath the application options with the same name as the rule set that you've given it. Um, and we're looking, you know, we have a Project Thunderdome which can be modified to do something like that. Uh, and we're looking to make that out of the box functionality for Project Thunderdome as well. All right. Um, here's one that says, uh, "If I rename the copied file, will the IDW name change to the new name as well?" Correct. If we're using Auto, uh, if you want to copy the drawing file separately, though, we. So there's a question about um, thumbnail capabilities with inside the copy design command. Mm -hmm. uh, as in showing them? Yes. I should have... Uh...
Let me find it again. Um, so Andrew had a question that said, uh, if a part is being copied and the drawing shows the warning that it will be edited, but the drawing is in a release state, will lifecycle permissions prevent the edit from occurring? Yes. So you will, um, uh, in that instance, we will see uh, during the pre-checks when you ex. One more path there. Let me just go through these. I think there might have been one more that I missed. Um, that's most of them. I think um, so. Dave Katz has a couple follow-up detailed ones. So I may try to um, have you guys follow up offline. Um, and I'll help broker that between Alan and Dave. Uh, yes, we're definitely recording. Um, all of you will receive an email follow-up with a link to the recording uh, probably tomorrow. Um, otherwise, uh, normally the way it works is if you just go back to the registration page itself, uh, there's another way to get to it. But we always try to do our best to do a follow-up and make sure that you guys get those recordings. Um, one more round on hand follow-ups. All right, so there is none. Um, thanks everyone uh, for joining today. Uh, one little reminder that I'll give you other than um, just uh, don't forget about AU. Make sure you guys um, um, ch check out the uh, Convince Your Boss Toolkit up there. Um, that's a really good utility to help talk uh, about the, the cost involved and the benefits you'll receive. Um, but then the other thing that I want you to do a quick save the date on is uh, two weeks after Autodesk University, which is the week of December 14th. Um, during that week, we're going to do a series of webcasts um, to celebrate National Vault Day. Um, December 18th is the anniversary of uh, when we um, acquired the vault technology from a company called True Innovations. Uh, last year, we had an event that uh, had over 600 participants. Um, so we hope to knock that out of the park again this year with over 600 folks. Um, so be on the lookout, but pencil that in is the week of 12-14. We're going to do a series of webcasts. So we're going to do some AU repeat classes and some, uh, some great content for uh, existing customers and for new customers. Um, but with that, uh, Alan, thanks so much for your time today um, and uh, showing everyone. If anyone has future topic ideas, just email me directly at uh, kevin.robinson at autodesk.com. And uh, hopefully we'll see you guys online. Uh, well, actually, we'll hope we see you at AU online for uh, the National Vault Day events and then uh, and uh, the next Vault Talk. So thanks, everyone, and have a great day. Thanks for your time, everyone.